Hey there, welcome back to the show. This is the Holy Post Podcast. I'm Phil Vischer. I am here with Christian Taylor. Hey, Phil. Hey, everybody. Hi, Christian. And Sky Jatani. Hello. Hi. Jason's here, too. Hi, Jason. Hey there. How are you? Good. How are you? Thanks. Good. Thanks. And we have a special guest, Ryan Burge, who we'll introduce shortly. Hi, Ryan. Hello, everybody. Hi. Uh, glad you could be here. Every Christian, are you uh, here in Vegas? I am in Las Vegas. You're in I have Vegas. Yeah, trying to recover from the election. And um, I am in a fountain view room at the Bellagio. And really, honestly, I don't need to leave. It's beautiful entertainment every half hour during the day and every 15 minutes at night with synchronized music and lights and streaming fountains. So probably great unless you really have to go to the bathroom. (laughs) Uh, yeah, a, but at least there's at least there's a bathroom close by bathroom. when you're in a hotel. You got the fountain, you've got the bathroom, you're good, you could stay there forever. Okay, here's the theme song. What's the news that you like the most? Who's your favorite podcast host? If it's breakfast, get your toast. It's Sky and Phil and the Holy Post. Sky and Phil and the Holy Post. And sometimes Christian... Okay, we are, uh, what day is it? It's Monday. We are recording this on Monday the 9th. So the election was Tuesday. We kind of found out the results finally Saturday. We Depends found on out who on, you believe. Yeah, we found out on Sunday that half of America doesn't like the results. And now it's Monday and we're still hovering in a somewhat semi-vegetative state between accepting or not accepting the results. You know, but after every lunch election, half of America doesn't like the results. But what's going on here is a little different. It's you, think not it's di- you think it's different? You think it's different than last time? I do. When, especially when, when, especially when last when time, they, do you remember when, when Hillary Clinton said, I'm going to do rallies to get my supporters to reject the results of the election? Do you remember that part? Yeah. And with Rudy Giuliani having a press conference in front of a Four Seasons landscaping company. Yeah, I don't remember that part last time either. What were you going to say, Christian? I was just going to say, last time I don't remember the government not releasing any funds or protection or anything for, you know, the president-elect. I don't remember that part either. So it's a little different. How about how about you, Ryan? Oh, who's Ryan, you ask? Who is this Ryan? <laughs> Who is this? Tell us more about this Ryan, Phil. Uh, We've talked about Ryan Burge quite a bit because he tweets fascinating stats like approximately every 38 seconds, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Fascinating stats always coming out on his Twitter account. And I pick them up frequently and and sometimes read them on the show because they're so interesting. Ryan P. Burge is an assistant professor of political science at Eastern Illinois University. His research focuses on the intersection between religiosity and political behavior. Ooh, that seems timely. That seems like a, a focus that could get you on a lot of podcasts over the last two weeks. Wouldn't you say, Ryan? That's been my goal my entire life. 15 years ago, I started grad school and said, I want to be on a podcast with Phil Vischer, the VeggieTales guy, when I'm 38 years old. Here we uh-huh. go. Uh-huh. And, it, and it worked. And you worked because you believed in yourself, right? That's right. That's, that's the American dream. I'm living it right now. You're living the dream. He's also, is this true? You're an American Baptist pastor? That is true. I've been in my current church for 14 years last month. Wow. Wow. So you're, bi- you're bivocational. I am bivocational. I have been that way my entire ministry career since I was 20 years old. Wow. So you make the big bucks from academia so that you don't have to pull money out of your church. Um, I make zero big bucks from anywhere. It's small bucks add up to medium-sized bucks, I believe, is the calculation there. Okay. Okay. Small bucks. Small bucks from both sides add up to just enough to keep your head above water. That's the goal. In Charleston, Illinois, a, a town I had not heard of until just now. You're not the only one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, before we get, I think people want, and probably Ryan really wants, before we jump into him telling us what just happened, which he's going to do with amazing clarity and decisiveness, uh, I do think we need to do a news of the butt. And now it's time for news of the butt. Of all weeks. This is the week we're going to do news of the butt. Isn't yeah. are we already talking about news of the butt? <laughs> Everything feels like news all of the, the time. Butt. But um, okay, so so this is just 
this is just fun. A Tesla driver accidentally butt dialed a $4,200 upgrade to his car. Ooh. Florida, Florida physician Ali Vaziri uh, butt dialed himself into a $4,200 enhanced autopilot upgrade for his Tesla Model 3, and he's still waiting for a refund. My phone was in my jeans, Vaziri told CNBC. I took it out, put it on this charger that comes with your Tesla, and that's it. A minute later, I got the text. I've never purchased anything through the Tesla app before. He ended up purchasing a uh, more than $4,000 option that gives him unlocks fancy self-driving features, including automatic lane changing parking and the summon feature that lets you summon your car to drive from the parking lot to you. But he didn't mean to. His butt did it through the app. And now he's been having a hard time getting a refund. I don't know why he wants a refund. I mean, that all sounds awesome. Yeah, but who wants to spend $4,200 for it? Is there a way to get those things off of your car once they've been downloaded into the system? Like, can he return it essentially? I think that's what he's wrestling with. I think, I think that's, it's how do you return virtual features? There was actually a case um, about a year ago where someone bought a used Tesla that had those features enabled that it wasn't supposed to. So he paid extra for those features and they remote disabled them after like six months because they realized this Tesla with this account isn't supposed to have those. And so he lost those features. So they can do it. I just don't know about their refund policy. Wow. It's like when you're getting free cable at your new house and you're not supposed to and you just don't ever call the cable company. Right. That's you the only hope, way to keep it. Hope nobody notices. Right. So, Does that so mean has, they're connected to your car all the time and can do whatever yes. they want whenever they want? Yes. Yeah, it's basically an iPhone with wheels. And since it's a, an auto driving car, you know, someone could hack into the system and have your car just drive you to Moscow. Just so you can't get out, doors lock, off you go. It's, you know, it's like Night Rider worst case scenario where Kit goes crazy and delivers you to the Russians. It could happen. It could that's the world we now live in. Ryan, crazy. Ryan, do you have any data on that, Ryan? I, I bet you not a lot of Republicans buy Teslas. I'm just going to bet you that right now. Okay. Thank you. That's valuable. <laughs> That's valuable. Uh, Sky, what's the most your butt has ever cost you? Oh, I, got, hmm. I don't know. A relationship with people when I've accidentally dialed them and said things that I shouldn't have. Oh, <laughs> Are you speaking yeah. for yourself or me? <laughs> no, I'm just saying I've done that before. I was answering for myself. I'd like to believe that I have a, my butt is a is a net positive asset that it's actually earned me more money than it's cost me. I believe that. And I'll just leave it at that. I, I had to pay for seminary somehow. How did you use your butt to pay for seminary? <laughs> no, I'm joking. I know. Were you a, were you a butt model? Were you a butt model in seminary? No, were I'm you? quite certain that I will because never have been be, and never will be. That would be an interesting kind of indie movie about a seminary student who a, a, a male seminary student who does like underwear modeling and has to keep it secret. They have to keep their lives separate. So he only models in shots that don't reveal his yeah. face. Yeah, 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 uh-huh. yeah, yeah. or his theology. Just. It's just the middle, just the middle. You're an underwear model by night, seminary student by day. And then he becomes a world famous pastor and it all comes back to bite him in the butt. Okay. I think that's enough for the news of the butt today. Ryan, do you have anything you'd like to add to that from your own personal experience in academia? Uh, I'm going to pass right now, Phil. This has been the news of the butt. <laughs> you are smart, young man. You have obviously been on many podcasts. Okay. Okay, let's talk about uh, what just happened. And the reason I invited Ryan on, because, you know, it's time to sing the What Have We Learned song. And so what we have learned applies to our lives today. And God has a lot to say in his book. You know, we know that God's word is for everyone. And now that our song is done, we'll take a look. Okay, we need to know what we've learned. What was different from 2016, what was the same as 2016, what changed, what we talk a lot about uh, the evangelical world and white evangelicalism. What do we know? What do you know this week, Ryan P. Burge, that you didn't know two weeks ago? That Donald Trump lost. Is that is that the right do answer? You know, 
Do you I, know that? I I am fairly certain of that, but if I go on my Facebook, I become less certain of that for some reason. Yeah. Okay. I, I don't understand that part. No, I I mean I think listen, we're in like hot take city right now. I mean, we're less than a week out, you know. Yeah. So like yeah. the chattering class is like hot take, and then someone else comes with a hot take to like overcome your hot take about maybe it's really not this thing. Um mm-hmm. I think that like I think the overarching thing we we've seen is that that, that Joe Biden got a modest victory. I think that's the best way I would describe it. There was like the blowout scenario yeah. where he wins like 400 electoral college votes and like they pick up 25 seats in the House and they and the Democrats win 53 seats in the Senate, clear victory and blue wave and yada, yada, yada. Uh, that didn't happen. Um, I think, again, I think it's a modest victory for the Democrats. They won the White House, which is obviously a big prize, but they'll probably not take control of the Senate and they actually probably lost a handful of seats in the House. So if yeah. they would have lost the White House, it would have been an absolute drubbing for the Democrats this time right. around. Right. Um, you know, so but also it also hinges on two runoff races in in Georgia um, for the Senate seats, and if both of them turn blue, um, it's fifty fifty in the in the Senate, and that means Kamala Harris breaks a tie. So the Senate basically becomes a, a Democratic led institution, which means you have unified government. So really, two Senate seats could switch the whole narrative on what this twenty twenty election was and will be, and we just don't know the answer yet. Right. But what did we learn about evangelicals? That evangelicals love them some Republicans, uh, and they always have, and they always will. I think that's what um, I'm actually right. My hot take is that the Democratic Party should abandon any hope of peeling off white evangelicals at any point now or in the future. Um, I'm reminded of that great Charlie Brown cartoon with the football and Lucy holding the football. And mm-hmm. every time she's like, I'm going to kick the football. And Lucy's like, I'm going to hold it for you. She's like, are you sure? And she's like, yeah, I'm going to hold it for you. And then, uh, you know, he runs up to try to kick it and she pulls it away again. And he lands flat on his butt. A little mm-hmm. throwback there. Mm-hmm. And, news uh, of. Yeah, news of. News of the butt. And that's exactly what Democrats are with white evangelicals. Every year, like, this is the year we're going to win back a big chunk of white evangelicals. And every year, the exit polls come out, 78% of white evangelicals voted for Trump which is exactly the same share that voted for McCain 12 years ago. Nothing has changed. I mean, okay, but it, here's my question, though. Was there actually any real effort in 2020 for Democrats to win white evangelicals? Did they put any money or staffing or energy behind that? Oh, yes. I feel really? all, There's certain little like pockets of Twitter when I write this piece are going to hate me because they have spent the last two or three years raising money and doing bus tours and doing tweets and doing social media, spending millions of dollars from donors to get nothing done. I mean, that's really the reality. There's a group called Vote Common Good yeah. uh, that that, uh, that was uh, a group out of Minnesota. A guy spent you know $5 million on or something. Didn't change anything. Uh, but they're going to try again next year because that's going to be the winner next year. Is is part of the dilemma that, let's say you're a 25-year-old who grew up in a white evangelical church subculture and you now vote Democrat, but you don't identify as an evangelical, so you're, you're, you're not counted in the switch? Yeah, I think that's that's a big piece. Of, well, okay, so what makes this complicated is you would assume if a lot of that was happening that evangelicals would get smaller over time. Mm-hmm. And no matter what you've heard, the share of Americans who are white evangelicals has basically dropped a point in the last 15 years. So it's not really happening at this like systematic level that people are talking about, right? That just thousands and thousands of evangelicals are leaving every day. They're getting slightly smaller, but not very much smaller. So the people who are left, and this is key, the people who are evangelicals now are more politically and religiously conservative than they've ever been since I can go back in polling to 1972. For instance, 60% of evangelicals now believe in a literal Bible. That means the Bible is literally true word for word. It's never been that high in the last 48 years because the people who are left are true believers, everybody else sort of drifted away over the last 30 years, which leaves a really bad outcome for evangelicals and I think for everybody else too. But are the numbers smaller or is because if we're if we we're down to the true believers, are there as many true believers as there used to be in the broader group? So I think what's happened is a lot of mainline Protestants who actually were more conservative theologically shift over and became evangelicals. But I also think that, you know, more Hispanic evangelicals have jumped on the bandwagon, for instance, yeah. and really buoyed that number, right? So if you look at white, when people say like white evangelicalism is in decline, really what you're saying is white people are in decline. Because evangelical, the share of white people who are evangelicals is exactly the same today as it was 15 years ago. It's just that white people as an overall share of the population have declined pretty dramatically over the last 30 years. And that's why white evangelicals are declining. It's not because there are more and more people becoming nuns. It's because less and less people are are white. 
Okay. Okay. So for, but before we go further, when you say evangelical, or, or when the when the pollsters that you follow say evangelical, what do they mean? Is this is this self identifying? Is it behavioral? Is it belief based? What's mm-hmm. our definition? Okay, so there's two ways to look at it. Um, the, the best way, in air quotes, is the tradition, which means we ask you what your religious tradition is. You say Protestant, and then we ask you, are you Baptist, Methodist, Episcopalian, Lutheran? Then we ask you what specific type of Baptist you are, and then there's a list. If you are on this list, your church is on this list, then you are a part of an evangelical denomination. The other way, which is the way the exit polls use, is what's called self-identification. They basically ask you, do you consider yourself born again or evangelical? And then you can say yes or no. And then that the problem with that measurement is it throws in Catholics, it throws in Buddhists, it throws in Jews, right? So it doesn't just stick to Protestants. And actually, by the way, 15% of Catholics say they're born again or evangelical now, including our vice president, Mike Pence. So you get a different, the Venn diagram doesn't overlap perfectly between self-identified evangelicals and evangelicals by tradition. The, the better one is evangelicals by, by tradition. Okay, well, that's that's interesting. And is that number of th- that percentage? Because I remember at one point, uh, I think Gallup just used, "Do you consider yourself born again?" And they decided that is what evangelicals was. And when they first asked that question, at you know, in the late seventies, early eighties, it peaked at a high of like fifty percent of Americans said, yeah, "I've been born again." And wow, half of America is evangelical Christian, which was kind of the high water mark of well, we should definitely be able to take back the country. Well, then you go to Barna and it's like 7% of Americans yes, are evangelicals. Because so. Barna actually says, tell us what you actually believe. And and we have, you know, eight or nine points that you should believe that you should as- attest to. And if you don't, you're not evangelical. Yes. Yeah, so that, that thing is, okay, so with religion, there's, there's a call the three Bs, behavior, belief, and belonging. And so, you know, the one that everyone thinks about is belief, like you're religious because you believe stuff. And yeah. quite frankly, as a social scientist, I don't care what you believe. Like it's really immaterial most of the time. Um, and then there's behavior, like do you go to church or not? Do you pray or not? And that can help. It actually makes you more of already what you are. But the one that matters to me is belonging, which is like what group in, in social space, who do you say, yeah, those are my people. I'm going to sit with them at the cafeteria table. When I answer a survey, I'm going to go say I'm Southern. So people always ask me, can you be an evangelical and never go to church? And the answer is unequivocally yes, because an evangelical who never goes to church is more politically conservative than a mainline Protestant who never goes to church or a Catholic that never goes to church, because you still picking Southern Baptist means something. You still say, those are my people, even though you never go and worship with them, instead of saying you're religiously unaffiliated or something. It still means like, these are people like us, and who am I in social space? And I'm an evangelical in social space. That stuff really does matter. Okay, but at that point, we're getting pretty far from a belief system. We're we're really just into association like veganism or republicanism. Yeah, but I'm a social scientist, right? So for me, the social world is all that matters. You're um, also a Baptist pastor. Oh, Ryan. yeah. Well, and, Do I need to remind you? Uh, I am, but I also know that like every Baptist church that I've, American Baptist church I've been a part of is completely different theologically. Some are very, very liberal and some are very, very conservative. All within yeah. two American Baptist churches, 20 miles apart. One could be like to the far right of Southern Baptist and one could be right where the Episcopalians are and they're the same denomination, right? So I think it's, no, listen, measuring religion is hard. And we, to be completely honest with you, we have no idea how many religiously unaffiliated people there are in this country right now. No matter what Gallup or Pew or anybody else says, I've looked at this enough to know. We can give you a good estimate, but I can't be sure of that estimate. So we talk about the number of evangelicals. It's really just an educated guess and sometimes not even a very good guess. Yeah. Okay. Did uh, You did a, a paper, an essay about a year ago trying to decide whether, I think the title was, is white born-again Christian just a synonym for Republican? Like, are the two terms basically the same now? Do they mean the exact same thing? And, and tell us what your conclusion was. Yes. <laughs> and, and nothing <laughs> about 2020 it. has changed that? No, no, no. I think in any ways, like I feel like vindicated a year ago in a lot of ways, like nothing. So really, okay, if you really want to see daylight between white evangelical Republicans and just evangelicals or the Republican Party in general, it becomes on things like gambling and marijuana. Like that's where the opening opens up and that's it. Like everything else, like that is, if I could like preach like a message from the pulpit about politics, here's what I would say. Everyone says that white evangelicals are a special kind of Republican because they're values voters, right? They care about things like abortion, gay marriage, transgender, da, 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 da. The reality is clearly this. They love the Republican Party 
all the way through. There's very little they do not like in orthodox Republicanism, whether it be taxation, tariffs, immigration, or social issues. They are 100% on board with everything. So don't think of them as a type of Republican. Think of them as the prototypical Republican because they're literally the base of the party now. So what is, uh, put your pastor hat on for a second. What are the implications of that then as a pastor? <sighs> Yeah. So uh, here's the problem we just talked about. I think what happened over time is that, okay, so in 1976, 50% of all white weekly churchgoers in America were Democrats, and now it's 25%. Um, so what we've seen is that, that the church has become politically homogenous. Everyone's the same in churches now. I don't think people understand this, but like in most small towns in America, if you are a Democrat and a Christian, there is no church for you. And I am not exaggerating that at all. OK, there are very few churches in America at all, generally speaking, that are liberal to the left of center. I know people like the Episcopalians, the Episcopalians are less than two percent of the population and they're getting older every day and they're probably not going to exist in 20 years as a denomination. OK, the United Methodists are the largest mainline tradition in America today. Fifty five percent of them are Republicans. OK, so where's the liberals there? They're just they're, they don't exist. So if you're the pastor of a church, the people in your pews are overwhelmingly Republicans on balance. Ninety percent of the time, they're going to be overwhelmingly Republicans. The problem is that pastors are supposed to speak prophetically to their congregation. And that includes maybe talking about some negative things about the Republicans policy on, I don't know, things like family separation at the border. Let's just throw that idea out there. Right. So if you do speak against that, you know, you're going to anger at least 75 percent of your congregation. What you also know as a pastor, and this is what a lot of people who are outside the pastor don't realize is you can be fired at any reason for any time. And you have basically no recourse unless it's written into your contract. And the vast majority of churches don't write contracts. I mean, you don't even get severance. So they literally could, if you said Black Lives Matter from the pulpit today, you could get fired tomorrow, tomorrow for saying that. And you would have to pack your stuff and move your family across the country to find a new church and lose all that time and all that money and all that grief for saying something courageously political. So what do pastors do? They do nothing, right? They stop speaking politically and they start just hitting the least common denominator being vanilla as humanly possible. And so what happens is the, the people in the, in the congregation's worldview is never challenged from the pulpit. It's just not talked about at all. And I've had many pastors say, listen, I get in for an hour a week. Fox News gets in for 24 hours a day, seven days a week, right? I can't compete with that. So I just gave up. And so now they worship at the church of Hannity in the church of Laura Ingraham, the church of, of Tucker Carlson. And so what's happened was pastors have have become cowards, but I get why they're cowards because I'm a coward too. I do the same thing, you know? So how do you feel about this, Ryan? Do you think it's <laughs> oh. generally, an, it's generally an encouraging trend? No, no, listen, but I want to be clear. Like I am not a like way far left hippie liberal. Like there are things about the, the Democratic Party today that irritate me to no end. I think the church is best and the church was best when it had people from both political sides being able to meet and discuss the issues of the day in a safe, open, welcoming environment. The church facilitated that for a long time. And now all you have are churches full of echo chambers. It's just people from one spectrum getting crazier and crazier every day. And no one stands up and goes, wait a minute. Like you might be too far gone there now because there's no one to say that anymore. And the problem is American Christianity, American evangelical Christianity has become more and more Republican every day. And if the church wants to grow in America, a third of America at least identifies as Democrats. And most of them go, yeah, church is not for me anymore because it's a bunch of right wing mega Trump Republicans. And that's bad for the future of American Christianity and the future of American politics, by the way. Isn't, isn't what you're describing, though, about the church just what's happening everywhere in the great sort, right? People don't associate with people from across the aisle. We don't even live in regions anymore where there's political diversity very much. I agree. I mean, I think that's the reality is I think the biggest sort in America is urban rural. Like I think there, like urban areas have become bluer and bluer and rural areas have become redder and redder. The county I grew up in, Marion County, Illinois, 40,000 people. My first election was 2000 and 2000, Bush versus Gore. 51 48. That was the election. Bush got 51. Gore got 48. You know what it was last week? 70 30. Okay. So we're talking a 20 point shift in 20 years. There are 15 county board seats on Marion County, Illinois. They are 15 Republicans on that board today, not a single Democrat. Okay. That is what we're talking about in small towns in America. You cannot be a liberal and live in small town America anymore. Okay. Well, so there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of big cities where you can't be a Republican. Absolutely. That's, yeah. that's what I was going to do that point. You cannot live in a big city and be a Republican too. But you know where I think the battleground is? It's the suburban areas. 
I think that's really where, and what's interesting about that religiously is a lot of the growth in non-denominational churches in America are happening in suburban areas across this country, right? So now they're thrown into this like battle, this big cosmic battle between red and blue in America. And now non-denominational pastors, you know what they care about? They care about growth. Let's be really honest here. They want to grow a church big because that's what they're known for. And how do you grow though? By not talking about politics. Right. By being bland and vanilla and welcoming to everybody. So even they don't speak, you know, truth, biblical truth to people. They just say, okay, here's three things to be a better husband, or here's four ways to raise a better family. Right. They don't like talk about the real controversial issues of the day. And by the way, you can, but you know what you need to do? You need to give grief to both sides. That's the problem. You need to give as much grief to this side as you give to that side. And you can biblically. If you think that, 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 that one party represents God better than the other, then you haven't read your Bible or understood American history. Okay, because both parties do well and both parties do bad on things of of biblical concern. I assume that's the uh, Baptist pastor speaking there, not the sociologist. Uh, Yeah, I mean, I try to, you know, blend everything together, but I think you're right. I mean, I think like, listen, 100 years ago, the most the best selling book in American uh, religion was the theology of the social gospel by Walter Rochenbush. Right. Which today would be considered to be heretical in most evangelical churches. Scandalous. It is. Although he, you know, he was a modernist and it was in the middle of the modernist fundamentalist controversy. So he was controversial then, too. True. But I think it's so funny that like now now like Glenn Beck's like if your church is about social justice then you need to find a new church right it's like whoa right. like what happened in America today like there's there's good both sides you know both sides Christian I would like to give some yes I would like to give some hope I would like to give some hope um and because it really is overwhelming I I agree with you hundred percent Ryan I do not question you one at all um and so I have been really thinking about this issue like how do we change this uh, problem that we have is particularly where pastors are coming from and I want to share uh, something that I know about that's happening in Pinedale Wyoming there's a church called Church of the Res. And it's pastored by a guy named Matt Murdoch. I know about this church because his wife is my best friend. And he does come from a very conservative background. He and his wife were missionaries in Africa for 15 years. Um, And even though he is very Republican and conservative, he is also centered in the gospel. And he has really tried to not run away from his mission or his mandate to speak truth to his congregation in probably the most difficult place he possibly Possibly could be. I mean, people are furious at his wife at times for wearing a mask right now. Uh, it's really heartbreaking. But what they've decided to do is have these listening sessions once a month where they come together and they discuss the cultural issues of the day in light of what the gospel says. And then from the pulpit, I've been listening to his sermons for the last month. From the pulpit, he is talking about the issues that are core to Christianity and to our faith through Romans. Um, And he really directly talks to both sides, not in terms of how they should vote or what they should think, but in terms of what the gospel says in light of how we treat each other in this charged political environment and how we think about the other including all of the people that are disenfranchised. And I really think that is the balance that we're looking here and for. And I think that, you know, pastors need to realize that, that yes, they are in a precarious position, but they can talk about social issues, uh, but really focusing on what the truth of Jesus Christ says in the Bible. I mean, that's, that's the hope I see. It's the most encouraging thing. They've received a lot of pushback. But they've also received people that are beginning to engage in conversation as they model that in those listening sessions. And I think that's what we have to have. We have to have somebody modeling how to have the conversations with one another in a godly way. I agree. Yeah. I agree 100%. I talk about the Imago Dei a lot, which is the idea that every human being was born in the image and likeness of God. And that's a great theological principle because it makes the Democrats look bad and the Republicans look bad, right? Because it speaks to the to the deep ideas of like every life matters, including the pre-born, but also, you know, illegal immigrants matter. People with disabilities matter. People who don't look like you matter. Black lives matter, right? There are ways to talk theology that, like I said, that are overarching that say it's not about Republican versus Democrat. Like God's not on one party's side. That's right. That's what makes me so mad, though, as pastors talk about good versus evil. Like one party is clearly good and the other party is clearly evil. Right. And it always, almost always toward the, the Democrats are evil. It's like, yeah, but you separate families at the border, dude. Like you can't be that good. Let's be completely honest here. 
that's what we have to talk about is you got to call out both. And that's what prophets did, by the way, in the Old Testament. They called out everybody when they when they messed up, not just their own people or the other side. Right. So, Ryan, so yeah, Ryan, ahead. do yeah. you see if you look at the last couple of elections, do you see anything happening with young evangelicals that might differentiate them from their parents or grandparents? Uh, or are they or are they ceasing to be evangelicals? Okay, so you're right. That's I was going to hit that point. They're smaller because if they were liberal, they would have left the church, or they're going to leave the church as soon as they hit 18 and get a chance. Right? They're out. They're going to become religiously unaffiliated. Um, I will say this: the data says that 65 percent of young evangelicals are in favor of gay marriage. That's 18 to 35 year olds. So I think the church is moving very quickly on that measure. Um, I actually argue in a piece I wrote for RNS, like that's the that's the the conundrum facing the American evangelical churches. Young people who is where they need to grow from. Young people dramatically oppose them on gay marriage and on women in the pulpit. Seventy five percent of of evangelicals want women to preach, um, and churches won't allow it. So I young, think young evangelicals are all evangelicals. Uh, of all evangelicals, seventy five percent are in favor of women in the pulpit. And I had multiple surveys that back that up, by the way. Um, and this, and I've, I I even ask it like, okay, teach Sunday school. Uh, be a worship leader, preach at a women's retreat on the weekends or preach behind the pulpit on Sunday morning. Like I was explicit as you could be. So people wouldn't be like, oh, that he didn't mean preaching. No, no, no. We use the word preach. 75% of evangelicals are in favor of women preaching from the pulpit on Sunday morning. So I think those are the issues that are going to drive young people who could be evangelicals away because they believe in women's rights and they believe in gay rights, right? So how does a church continue to be, you know, have fidelity to the scriptures for what they understand it to be, but also reach out to young people, that's going to be a harder ask every day. So, okay, that brings up an important question, though. If if so many evangelical pastors are not willing to be faithful to scripture and calling out the Republican Party for its, you know, departures from, from morality or whatever, and they're just being apolitical or silent and all this stuff, what makes you think that they won't capitulate when the demographics change and people want women in the pulpit and gay marriage, mm-hmm. if, if, it's, if ultimately it's pragmatism that's driving the church here, yeah. isn't that going to happen? I think that, yeah, I think the church, the church cares about growth. I mean, let's be honest, church right. growth is a billion dollar industry, if not more. And right now, just being, being silent about republicanism or the idolatry of, of partisanship in the church is a way to keep growing. Mm. I think it, it's hit its limit though. I think there's only you've tapped you've tapped out Republicans, and now thirty to thirty five percent of Americans are religiously unaffiliated. Where are they? If you want to keep growing, where is the pot going? I think that's that's the problem that I have with a lot of churches that have grown. They don't want to they don't want to admit to this. They have cannibalized other churches. They have not brought people in from the outside. So what happens is it's basically going to be a bunch of corporate mergers in American Christianity until there's no one left to merge with, right? It's like acquisitions, you know, like when a young company, like a tech company grows up and gets a little bit big, Facebook buys them up. That's what's going to happen to a lot of these small denominations, right? They're going to get eaten up by larger traditions. And there's so that the church wants to continue to grow and actually increase market share, not just move it around. They have to reach out to the nuns. And listen, you're right. I, I agree with you, Scott. I think pragmatism is going to win the day here, but that also means they're going to have to allow for gay marriage and women pastors. But it's also going to be they're going to have to stop talking about Republican talking points all day long, too, because that only gets you so far in the modern context. Holy mackerel, that's confounding. <laughs> I'm so confused. I'm going to, st- st- I'm not going to start a church right now because I'd have no idea what to do with it. A uh, podcast seems like a better idea. So, okay, uh, would you put um, racial justice in that same category of how, we, you know, what do you see from younger people there versus their elders? So younger evangelicals especially are much more focused on racial justice. They have what are called lower racial resentment scores, uh, which is sort of a measure of kind of racism, but not really things like, well, Irish people did well when they were discriminated against here. Why can't black people do well? Questions like that. Right. Right. Um, And we do know that there's what's been called the great awakening has happened over the last five or 10 years in America, which is everyone on racial issues has moved further to the left. Phil's the spearhead of that, actually. You were? yeah, I'm the tip of the spear, apparently. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> well done, Phil. Thank um, you. But it's, it's been asymmetrical, though, right? Like it's um, everyone has moved to the left, but Democrat or uh, Democrats have moved further to the left, but evangelicals have moved less. They moved to the left, but less far to the left. Like they haven't moved as much. Um, so even there, they're sort of lagging behind. By the way, 30% of evangelicals still think the immigrants take Americans' jobs. 
Um, so, you know, there's there's definitely all this data that indicates. And by the way, it was 40 percent 20 years ago. So they have moved, you know, in the in the social justice way, but just slower than everybody else. They're like 10 years behind on this kind of stuff. So there are green shoots like I'm not totally bummed out. It's just that when 78 percent voted for Trump in 2016 and then everything happened and then 78 percent voted him for again four years later, it's like, OK, well, nothing's changed. Cool. Huh. OK. Uh, any last questions for Mr. Burge while we're feeling uh, I'll, sunny I'll, and bright? I'll ask one more on kind of the pastoral front. You mentioned earlier pastor saying, I get him one hour a week, which even that is a bit optimistic. Uh, and Fox two, News gets two, two hours a month. Seems right. To be about more accurate. And Fox News gets him 24 seven. And, you know, they worship at the Church of Hannity and all that kind of stuff. What do you think is an appropriate pastoral response to that reality? Hmm. The, just the formative power of cable news and other outlets that are clearly shaping people's worldviews far more than their local churches. Mm -hmm. I would not do it from the pulpit. I'd be honest with you. I started as a series of conversations asking, I love to ask the conversation. Why, why can't I believe the same way that you believe? You know, what do you know that I don't know? Help, help, under, help me exp explain to me why the election was stolen. You know, so don't make it like you're wrong, you're dumb, you're stuck with Hannity, right? Say like, is is there another explanation for this of why votes were counted so slowly, let's say, right? Or just, you know, ask these questions that allow them to talk out loud and really, because here's what most people don't do. They don't create a coherent worldview. It's just a bunch of random snippets thrown together that don't create consistency. Try to, you know, try to make them think consistently about their life and about what they believe about Donald Trump and politics and the church, right? And then really start saying, well, what does the Bible say about that? You know, what does scripture say about these issues of like income inequality, for instance? Like, I think there's lots to be said about that. So don't lead with, I'm going to change your mind. Lead, let's, we'll have, let's have a conversation. And, you know, I'm a big believer in, I'm not going to, I'm whatever position you take, I'm going to take the other one just to be a contrarian, right? Just to make you think through what, and we might end up at the same spot where we started, but at least you got to roll it over in your mind once or twice and really think about what you believe and why you believe it. And honestly, most people, when they have that conversation, come out and go, hmm, I never thought of it that way, right? Because they don't really do the hard work, the intellectual work that it takes to have a consistent worldview. Is that is that something you've tried in a, say, small American Baptist church in a smaller town in rural Illinois? Absolutely. I, I, you know, I was talking to one of my friends. I said, the greatest thing I ever did in my church was just slowly make them understand that the world is not their, the world is not their world, right? That it's bigger than right, that. Right. And so I'll give you a good example. We had uh, a couple years ago, uh, we had a young man who came with his, his, his grandmother to the church. And then when I had invitation time, he came up front and he turned around and looked at the congregation and said, could you all pray for me? Um, I'm addicted to drugs. And I'm going to rehab today. And in the, 15 gray haired, 80 year old Republican people came up and laid hands on him. Like he, you know, like he was a human being. And I don't think five or 10 years before that, they would have done that. You know, he would have been shunned as a leper. Right. But I always make a point to say, like, the gospel is for people who are on the outside of society, right? The addicted, the depressed, the lonely, the isolated, the not good enoughs, right? That's who Jesus came to save. And I wanted to say, like, this is who Jesus came to save right here. I didn't have to say that. They knew that. Like they had right, internalized right. that. And listen, they all still vote for Trump, which is fine. Like I love all of them. They're great people, but at least they understand who their neighbor is. And at least they understand what love looks like. And they should love people who don't look like them, think like them, vote like them, or, you know, do drugs like them. Right. So that, 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 that person became a person, not an other, but a person. And I think that's what the gospel is about is about stop othering other people and make them you. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Stop Preach it, brother. othering other people and make them you. That kind of sounds like something Jesus said once or twice. You know what? Nadia Bowles Weber wrote this great book where she talks about, you know, if you create us versus them, God's always with them. He's always with them. Yeah. And I think about that all the time, right? Like that God is always on the outside. He's never on the inside. He's uh, my understanding of the gospel is God at the last shall be first and the first shall be last in the kingdom of God. I think that's the most profound piece of knowledge from the Gospels in a lot of ways because it reorders your thinking. You know, the people who are on earth, who are here on earth who think they have it all in the kingdom don't have anything. And God is for the outsider. 
Yeah, but Ryan, I'm pretty sure Nadia Bowles Weber is a Democrat. <laughs> <laughs> she is, but she also taught me a lot about the gospel, though, right? Because I'm willing to read, you know, Chuck Swindoll and the Nadia Bowles Weber back to back. Because wow, yeah, right, like well, the world's a little bit bigger than that. And get, getting back to your point, Ryan, that there's no monopoly on godly values here. If the Democrats are in power, there are those that they other. Oh, that, for sure. That the church needs to be speaking up for and representing and advocating for. And when Donald Trump or a Republican is in power, there are groups that they other that the church should be standing up for. So this isn't – it's not that one side gets this right and the other okay, wrong. So, so let's wrap this up. Okay, let's draw some conclusions. The church needs to be the church, mm-hmm. needs to have a prophetic voice, needs to acknowledge that the conservative white church – has become. There was an interesting piece in the New York Times, an opinion piece by uh, Elizabeth Brunig, who uh, the title is "Why Evangelicals Aren't What They Used to Be," and it's basically ma- making the argument that evangelical Christians became politically active, attached themselves to the Republican Party just for a few specific causes, not necessarily identifying with the entire Republican Party platform. And since then, in the last forty years, have assumed the entire Republican Party platform. So what started out as a marriage of, you know, these are the things that are important to us. Will you make them important to you, political party, turned into we are now you. It's the camel nose under the tent thing. Uh, Yeah, but did the tent jump on the camel or did the camel come (laughs) under the tent? I think it was an elephant, actually. (laughs) I'm not sure. I'm not sure which happened. So, So we need to prophetically call that out. And and people often say, well, Phil, why aren't you criticizing the other side? Well, because my side has not assumed the values of the other side. (laughs) That's not really the issue we're facing right now, is we have completely assumed the values. I mean, I have so many people arguing for, I I just read an article from a Christian complaining about how kids Christian kids weren't being raised in a Christian worldview. And then they listed the things that young people, young Christians aren't in favor of today and of of Christian worldview things, which included small government and low taxes. And I'm not sure exactly where those are in the Bible as major Christian worldview issues of of small government and low taxes, but we've assumed the entire platform of of the Republican Party and then gone looking for it in the Bible. To, to back it up. And we just need to say enough. Start. Don't start with a party platform. Start with the Bible and now examine both party platforms. And you realize neither of them line up. And if you find, if you believe one lines up completely with the Bible and the other doesn't at all, which many people have told me in the last 45 days, you're not starting with the Bible. You're starting with the platform. I remember years ago doing a sermon at our church, and I was talking about young people leaving the church and giving various reasons. And, and this gentleman came up to me afterwards who was really upset and trying to understand what I was saying. And I I knew he had adolescent kids or teenagers or college age kids or something. And we were going back and forth trying to explain my point. And finally, I just said to him, look, is it more important to you that your children grow up and vote Republican? Or is it more important to you that your children grow up and follow Jesus? And in all sincerity, he said to me, what's the difference? And he was not being sarcastic. He was not being funny. He could not tell the difference. And at that point, I was just like, I have no, I have nothing. I, I didn't know what to say. <laughs> like That's how united they are in some people's minds. All right. Last thoughts, Ryan, give us something encouraging. Okay. You got that. Oh, you can gosh. do that. Right. You got that in you. Right. 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 Uh, pull yeah, something okay. off your fake shelf behind you. Pull okay. something cheerful off your fake virtual shelf. Um, yeah, I think that, you know what, American democracy has endured for 220 years. It's going to figure this stuff out. I mean, we, we survived the civil war, the great depression, you know, the, um, the Vietnam war. I read about 1968 in Chicago, like how the country didn't fall apart after that. It amazes me, but, yeah, we but figured- they didn't have social media. <laughs> no, we don't have parlor. All my friends are jumping ship to parlor. Now all my conservative friends. So are, so are mine. I was just looking wait, at that wait, this wait. morning. What's parlor? Oh, Christian, Christian. It's where... <laughs> It's where all your most conservative friends are going to get off Twitter and Facebook because Twitter what is and f- it? it's another social media platform, but it's it's no restrictions on speech, so you can be as conspiracy theoried as you want to. Yeah, but that's yeah. Um, but you know what? You're right. I mean, I, I talk about this all the time. I go, we've always come back, but we've never had Facebook before. Right. So right. I don't know if that hey, pushes us hey, over he, the edge. This guy, he was trying to be encouraging. Well, I'm just playing and my you, role. <laughs> thank you. Now, no, your I, last chance, Ryan, bring it okay. around. 
bring sunshine. I want some sunshine. Listen, I think at the end of the day, we're all Americans, and I think we all understand that. I will say that the vast majority of voices about the voting situation have been Joe Biden's the president. Let's move on, right? The votes have been counted. It's all been legal. There's not been widespread, you know, massive violence in the streets anywhere. There's been isolated incidents. I think generally the outcome was what we thought it was going to be. And there was not all the backlash that we thought there was going to be, which gives me some kind of hope that we can move past this contentious period. If we can survive this, we can survive a lot. And it does look like, hey, vaccines on the way. You know, we're going to get through this. We've got a different president. And I do feel like next year's got to be better than last year because I don't think it can be any worse. And for the church, for the church, (laughs) Uh, I think the church is going to be smaller, um, but I think it's going to be in some ways more profound. I think people are going to start realizing in very small ways the church does stuff to make life less bad for people. You know, soup kitchens, closed closet, food pantries. I think people are going to realize all the good those ministries do. And guess what? When the church goes away, I don't see the atheists organizing to come chop down your tree after a hurricane. OK, they just don't do that. They don't have groups like that. So mm-hmm. I think that people are going to start valuing the church for what it is and what it does for society. And hopefully when all the political stuff sort of dies down a little bit, people will begin to understand that religion is a force for good in the world, especially in the United States. And we should support it at some level. If we make sure it is a force for good. That well, is. Yeah, we need to be more about what we do than what we say. And what we're doing right now is not much. And what we're saying is a lot. OK. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you, Ryan Burge. If people want to follow you on Twitter, what's your handle? At Ryan Burge. And I got a book. Can I plug a book? Yeah, plug a book. Plug a book. Yeah. I've got a book coming out on March the 7th called The Nuns, Where They Came From, Who They Are, and Where They're Going. About um, the his- history of the Catholic nuns? No, the history what? of the N-O-N-E-S. Be- oh. No, like, well, yeah. no, history Different of the nuns. No, the um, nuns. You're doing a history of the nuns? Yeah. Yeah, religiously unaffiliated people in America. So um, oh, comes out March seventh, one hundred and sixty pages, forty graphs. So if you like the graph to word oh, ratio, yeah. it's it's all for you. I um, like pictures. And it's, it's written not for an academic audience, for more a general interested audience for everybody. So come pick okay. it. Go. You can buy. You can pre order on Amazon right now. When it comes out, we'll have you back on the show to talk about it. Oh, I'm so excited! Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. yeah, put it on your calendar. Okay, uh, we have a guest, right, Sky? We think we have a guest. Yeah. We have a guest. Probably have a guest. Okay. And we will talk to you all next week. Thanks for tuning in. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thankfully, the election is behind us. But obviously, many of the divisions that have erupted in our society are not. And unfortunately, many of them are carried along by Christians as well. That's why right now is an ideal time to think again about what the church is really supposed to be. Are we just a collection of like-minded people who happen to share some doctrinal or religious beliefs? Or is there something more that we are called to be? Right now in With God Daily, we are exploring the church, what it is Jesus defines the church to be, and how that's supposed to look in a contemporary, pluralistic society. In a recent devotional, I quoted Justin Martyr, a second century church father, who defined the Christian community this way, we who formerly hated and murdered one another now live together and share the same table. Now we pray for our enemies and try to win those who hate us. That's a relevant message today in a society that is torn apart racially, politically, and economically. And in this divided time, the church can be an antidote. So if you'd like to explore this more deeply and perhaps reshape the way you've thought about the church, whether institutionally or communally, now's the right time to sign up for With God Daily. You can go to withgoddaily.com and learn more about how to sign up, how to download the mobile app, get access to the audio devotional, as well as the archives. With God Daily is available to anyone who makes a donation of any amount to support our ministry. And if you can't afford that right now, there's a way for you to sign up for free as well. So go to withgoddaily.com to learn more about the daily devotional for people who hate daily devotionals. All right, well, after that heavy conversation with Ryan Burge about statistics and the election and all the divisions that are going on in our society and the church, we kind of need a, a palate cleanser, something different. And for that reason, I'm really happy that Drew Dick is back on the podcast. He's been on The Holy Post many times. He's a good friend of mine. He is currently an editor at Moody Publishing, and he has his finger on the pulse of the publishing world and often has his nose in a lot of great books. And he's back with another installment of his favorite picks, the books that he highly recommends we engage. And none of these are political, which is kind of good because we need something different right now. So here's Drew Dick with his latest set of picks. Drew Dick, welcome back to the Holy Post. It's been a while. 
It has been a while. And I just hate to think of all the listeners out there who had nothing to read during that last, what, like three or four months. They're just waiting for my recommendations Indeed. so they can read again. And for those of you, the very few of you who actually watch this on YouTube, I just want to paint a picture for you. Drew is uh, set in front of a cavernous library with, what do they call those ladders on, on rails that go yeah, around? Yeah, slide back and forth. Yeah, and the, and the balcony bookshelves. It's, it looks very scholarly, very old and musty, a little bit like Drew. Um, but it's, it's- You didn't think this was those fake- Zoom backgrounds, did you, Sky? Oh no, not at all. Just, just like mine's okay. not my my office with the dog on the sofa and the and the Banksy on the wall. Um, <laughs> Drew, I'm so glad to have you back. And you are always uh, you have your ear to the rail, you have your finger on the pulse. You know your finger to the wind, something like that. Yeah, uh, yeah I like you it. know exactly what's going on out there. You see all things. You know all things. Pretty much. So you're here with another set of your picks of your recommended books that we must be engaging. Otherwise our faith in our life is not complete. Yep. What's the first one you've brought for us? You, you've set that up. Well, I like the ear to the rail. Although if you're doing that, like on a train track, you could get killed that way. Be careful. You'd have there, to kids. be pretty dumb, <laughs> pretty dumb. It's one of those Darwin awards kind of things. That's right. Yeah. yeah. You'd go down in, in history. All right. Let's see. Oh, I was going to start with what if Jesus was serious? Oh, we're just of talking course. about that, that a little bit. Right. So for yeah. the, you know, I mean, I, but I assume that every Holy Post listener has already read and bought copies for their friends of Sky's book, What If Jesus Was Serious? Oh, come on, Drew. Let's let's <laughs> let's lay the cards on the table. You have probably more invested in this book than I do. Well, that's why I'm bringing it up. I don't want to say anything, but I mean, whoever was the editor on this book was a genius. That's all I got to say. Clearly. You know, the other weird thing about our video setup right now is when just so the way it is on my screen, it looks like your microphone is the top of my head. <laughs> which yeah, is I see odd. that. Um, yeah. Sorry for the visual guys. Yeah, Drew was the editor on the book. He's the one who acquired the book for Moody Press, uh, Moody Publishers, whatever their official name is. So your job security is entirely rolled up in the success yep. of my book. Yeah, so if it stops selling, I'm, I'm out of a job. If, if that bang. book stops selling... I'll be okay, honestly. I, okay, but here, Scott, here's I'll the thing. Survive, okay. But you won't. So it, for Drew's going, sake, everybody. <laughs> it's going phenomenally well, okay? And I was cheering for you, okay? Full disclosure, right up until the point where it got more Amazon reviews than my book. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Well, yeah, to be fair, it's, it's Amazon you. reviews have surpassed most of my other books too. <laughs> there you go. I know. So that's, I am my own awesome. worst competition. Okay, I guess. here's my question though. Sorry, before we move on to the other picks, okay? Because it is a great book. But- for people who've read it, you know, it's got like a, you know, on every page, there'll be like a little devotional and then an accompanying doodle where Sky doodles uh, um, uh, through the Sermon on the Mount, basically. But Sky, are you worried that you could become known more as a doodler than an author? Like if people heard your name, like, oh yeah, Sky, he's my favorite doodler. I don't know if there's a lot of competition in that. <laughs> In that category. That's true. It's not a crowded field. It's not a crowded field of doulers. Yeah, I, I'm very conscious of not calling myself an illustrator. Oh, yeah. There because that takes genuine talent. And <laughs> like, let's put you it got this more way. skills than me. Let's put it this way, though. No one else is contacting me saying, will you please illustrate my book? <laughs> right. The I'm only children's one... book, would you please illustrate it for me? No one is asking me to do that. Uh, yeah, these these are not illustrations. They are definitely doodles and they only belong to my content because no one else would claim them. Uh, I do hope they they illuminate some truth for people. I, I'll say this. I did just turn in the manuscript for the next book, which is uh, it's called What If Jesus Was Serious About Prayer? Ding, ding, ding. And I, I think I really stepped up my doodle game. Nice. For that book. So when you yes. see, there's a, definitely a progression of the quality of the doodles. And in fact, I, I'm tempted, I'll confess this, I'm tempted to take my royalty check from what if Jesus was serious and buy myself a new Apple iPad with the you new pencil. Because I think I, I've stepped up my doodle game to warrant a larger screen and a better pencil. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm kind of proud of that. I think you should work that into the next negotiations with Moody. Say, I Clearly. need some gear, man. I need some higher tech to do these right. doodles. Yeah. Anyway, All right. Enough honestly, about my book. sorry. Okay. Yes. What, what are you. the books that you are here to recommend? What are okay. your picks, Drew? All right. Well, let me preface this by saying, 
everyone's sick of COVID, right? Just the spin cycle of the news and the literally death and the awful, awful um, reality that we're in. So my first book that I'm going to recommend is to get you thinking about something else. The Spanish flu, okay. 1918. <laughs> <laughs> it is the great influenza, the story of the deadliest pandemic in history. Okay. This is not a new book. No, it isn't. It's been, yeah, out you'd for think a while. like, at first I thought maybe like he wrote it like really quick to, to kind of capitalize on COVID, but this was written, I don't know, like 10 or 15 years ago. Because I think um, this is, yeah. this is the book that George W. Bush read when he was on vacation one day, well, he yes. was president, but he was on a break or whatever. And he read this book and he came back to his staff and he said, we need to prepare for the next pandemic. That and that was right. the origin of the White House office to combat this kind of stuff, which Obama then inherited and did some work on and then gave over to the Trump administration and they dismantled Perfected it. Oh, no. OK. Yeah. Something. <laughs> isn't, isn't that the story? Isn't this the that's book? The story. Bush? No, that's yeah. right. I just I heard that story. Um, and yeah, so it's been a really influential book that way. Uh, also, Bill Gates read it and was impressed by it and took away some some lessons from it. So, yeah. And it's just a great read. Like. It's a full history. It starts maybe 50 years before the Spanish flu of 1918. And it kind of packs in this whole history of medicine in the United States, which this was kind of shocking to me by like the, even the beginning of the 20th century, it was, it was super dated and weird. It was like, there'd been no advances almost in 2000 years. It's basically the old Greek stuff. They're still bleeding people and using leeches and stuff like that. So yeah, it's amazing how much medicine now, advanced in yeah. the 20th century crazy and it started to just explode in the early part of the 20th century before the pandemic uh and they were just starting to figure out like okay what causes this uh this, these kind of diseases uh unfortunately a little too late for as it turns out for this uh so yeah this the 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 pandemic breaks out in 1918 um not terribly bad at first in the spring of 1918 then comes roaring back in the fall and winter of 1919 and that's where it really does its most killing so uh, a little not deja vu, a little deja vu, hopefully mm -hmm. not a little deja vu. But anyway, I learned a lot. I mean, first of all, it, it was worse than COVID-19 in the sense that like COVID-19 kills mainly elderly people or people that are immune compromised. Whereas this flu, it killed the most people in the like 20 to 30 year old. Right. right. It turned the, the immune response was so uh, in overdrive that it tended to kill the healthiest people who right. had the strongest immune systems. It's like a cruel irony. Right. And so, and it kills, I mean, like the, the, the bottom estimates are like 50 million people worldwide. And we're talking about a time when earth's population was probably less than half of what it is now. Right. Um, and I mean, one estimate is just crazy to even think of was that it killed around eight to 10% of all young adults on earth at the time. I mean, wow. this is just nuts. It killed more people <clears throat> than the war. That's another thing I learned is that most wars, in fact, um, at least in history, more people die from diseases in the war than they do from actual battle wounds. Yeah. A little depressing. That is a little depressing. Thank are, you so are, much. Isn't this cheery? Isn't this going to yeah. lift you so up? So what, what about the <laughs> Spanish flu of 1918? I mean, there's the obvious relevance to what we're facing right now, but is there any application? Is there any lesson that you took from the book that you think we need to relearn today? Yes. So, I mean, you know, I talked a little bit about how medicine just wasn't ready for this. They didn't understand. Like halfway through, they kind of figure out, oh, we should put cloth over our faces and stuff. That's about as far as they got. Well, a lot of people haven't figured that out today either. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> but yeah, basically, but the, the, the bigger failures were when it came to political leadership. Right. And there was there's kind of the tale of two cities at one point during the pandemic. Uh, St. Louis uh, took the precautions. They banned crowds. They did the right things and they really minimized the death toll from the virus. Whereas Philadelphia, um, they had this big parade planned, uh, a war parade to kind of boost boost morale for the war. Uh, and the mayor and the city leaders were informed that this was a really bad idea by the, the doctors, like, don't do this. Cause it was like everyone in town would come out and they'd all like pack together super tight to see the parade. Uh, they ignored it because they didn't want to hurt morale and the war effort was so important. And then of course, days after the body started stacking up and it was just a nightmare. Um, and so, you know, this is, this is the author. Uh, his name is John Barry. He writes this, those in authority must retain the public's trust. The way to do that is to distort nothing to put the best face on nothing, 
to try to manipulate no one. And the problem was with, you know, this was during a time when it was all hands on deck. Uh, They're trying to win a war uh, in this country. And there, there were all these restrictions on the press. You couldn't print stories that made people, you know, skeptical of the war that, that even bad news was kind of like frowned upon. Um, It's funny because the, the, virus it was called the spanish flu right but it was actually a misnomer the only reason it was called the spanish flu is when it reached spain and started killing people they had a press that was actually free enough to write stories about this whereas in america we didn't really and so then it became identified with spain even though it actually originated in kansas best as they can tell really yeah i did not know uh, that and then of course world war one with the troops traveling all over the place kind of became the the catalyst for for the disease. So that, that quote that you read from the book reminds me. Did we talk one of these one of your sessions here about um, uh, Eric Larson's book, The Splendid and the Vile? Was no, that one? no. Th- th- that's his recent book that came mm. out about Churchill during the Blitz in World War II and the, the raids over London. And and one of the big takeaways from that book for me about Churchill's leadership was. Obviously, he had to keep the morale of the people up in order to they the odds against him were just enormous, right? And he had to keep the morale up, but but he never did that by um, shading the truth, right? Right. He always was brutally honest about what they were up against, in so that they would feel the gravity of the moment. But then he would inspire them to step up to that moment. We'll fight them on and, the beaches, but yeah. right? Exactly. <laughs> so I mean, that's so different than what we're hearing from some political leaders today that are trying to minimize the threat, you know, and we could go on about all that, but there, there, and the distrust that has been sown in the public about everything from mask wearing to the true numbers of the, of that are being reported of infections and, and deaths, all that, and every, people distrust all of it. And so we can't begin to have a unified national policy in combating this pandemic. Yes, exactly. And that's what went south during the Spanish flu in America, because people, they, they saw the news not making a big deal out of it. Uh, in fact, even denying it at some points. And then they saw their neighbors dying these horrible, excruciating deaths, and it totally broke down the public trust. And I mean, taking it into our current situation, um, I get that it's a comp, there's no good solution to COVID-19, right? I get it that like shutting down everything, uh, there, there are other consequences to doing that that are economic, that are real. I don't buy the kind of simple, like, oh, it's lives versus money, right? Okay, sure. I get that it's more complicated than that. But what we can't do, in my opinion, is distort, downplay, minimize, hide key information right. from people. We need to just be totally honest. Okay, this is what's happening. This is what we're up against. Uh, Cause that really has consequences, man. Like I talked to my parents recently and they're kind of in the risk category for this disease. They're in their seventies and they're like, Oh, it's not really spiking. And I'm like, uh, mom, you need to change the channel from a news station. I won't say, but <laughs> 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 right. we need to kind of have a clear eyed view uh, if we're going to respond, respond appropriately to it. All right. So what was the title of that exactly? The Great Influenza, oh, it's, right. and it's a monster. It's like John four or 500 pages. Yeah, but it's, well, it's a th- good read. At the moment when everyone is facing COVID fatigue, I'm sure the what they want is 500 pages on another pandemic. On Take them out of the moment. And disease. Well, and right. maybe because it was so much worse than even COVID-19. By contrast, maybe it'll cheer them up. I don't know. We'll so we'll see. You know, one of those, yeah, that's it. it could always get worse. <laughs> it could always get worse. Exactly. Okay, well, this one is actually an ice break from all the COVID stuff. My next recommendation, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. I think you've probably heard of this one. Gentle and lowly. Gentle and lowly. Gentle and lowly. The Heart of Christ for Sinners and Sufferers by Dane Ortland. I don't know Dane. He is though a PhD. He lives in a town called Wheaton, Illinois. Mm, You heard of it? it. No, okay. Yeah, I, I don't trust people from Wheaton. So I had a hard time getting past that. But once I started reading the book. Technically, like you know, it, I'm, I'm not from Wheaton. You're not from Wheaton. I'm from Glen Ellen. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So when someone says, can anything good come from Wheaton? <laughs> right. You're like, I'm Glen Ellen. And I lived in Carroll Stream. So maybe I have a little residual bitterness because like Carroll Stream isn't quite as classy as Wheaton. Okay. Like the no. real estate's a little cheaper up there. Yeah, it is. I was on the wrong side of the tracks, Sky. You're on the right side of the tracks. Well, I'm actually literally on the wrong side of the tracks for Wheaton because I'm on the south side. Ooh, which is, oh, see, I didn't even know, like within Wheaton. Oh, yeah. There's north like side. a hierarchy. Oh, yeah. At least in the Christian world, the north side is far more uh, Protestant. 
South side is much more Catholic. Okay. Um, yeah. We're, Let's hope there are no wars. Yeah. It could get ugly. It could get very ugly. All right. So Wait, sorry, I got uh, sidetracked there. D- Dane Ortland, gentle and lowly. What's the deal? Did you, did you, okay. are you the editor on this book? No. Too? <laughs> or is this just a Drew? How plug? dare you sky? Just cause I started with a book that I acquired. <laughs> no, actually this is, this is the hated crossway. No, which is also they're, in Wheaton. They're good folks. And that's in Wheaton too. Yeah. Um, yes. And, and it's kind of funny. He kind of did the same thing I did because he actually works at Crossway and they published his book. Pathetic. So it's very incestuous over there. Very incestuous. Okay. But this is a great book. Okay. And, and basically what he's doing is he's going like, okay, we talk a lot about, you know, and all these things, which of course are important. He's like, let's talk about the essence of who Jesus was. And let me, just quote him because I think he puts it really beautifully. In the one place in the Bible where the son of God pulls back the veil and lets us peer way down into the core of who he is, we are not told that he is austere and demanding in heart. We are not told that he is exalted and dignified in heart. We are not even told that he is joyful and generous in heart. Letting Jesus set the terms, his surprising claim that is that he is gentle and lowly in heart. Letting Jesus set the terms, his surprising claim is that he is gentle and lowly in heart. So I thought this was just kind of refreshing and beautiful. And it's a really kind of meditative, devotional kind of book talking about the essence of who Jesus was. I mean, not like his personality, but just the fact that that's who he is. He, that's how, his how self-description. Does he, how does he go on to define what gentle and lowly of heart means? Right. Because yeah. it's not language, especially lowly of heart. That's not language that we use today. It sounds almost King Jamesy in its <laughs> right in its framing, right? So, what is how does he interpret that? Well, I mean, first and foremost is that he's like, you know, when he talks about take my yoke upon you, for, you know, and learn from me, um, for I am. How does it go? My yoke is easy. My, my, my yoke is, is easy. Light. My burden is light. You'll find rest for your souls. That kind of yeah. thing. So, it, it, primarily relational, right? Like when we come to Jesus, he's not a taskmaster. He's not, I love how he puts it when he says, Jesus isn't trigger happy. Like he's not the kind of guy that was just like the screaming at people, demanding things, blustering all the time. Um, he's not Steve so, Jobs. He's not Steve Jobs. <laughs> Glad we cleared that up. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think there's a tendency sometimes you think, okay, well, yeah, Jesus is loving. He's forgiving. Okay. So he, you know, he saved me from my sins, he forgives me. So I'm kind of in the Christian club, but now I'm such a screw up as a Christian. I'm not making much progress. And then you like, imagine Jesus over there kind of shaking his head and disappointed with you. And he's saying, no, like even in your walk, even when you're messing up, Jesus is on your side. He loves you. His disposition towards you is one of gentleness and tenderness. Mm -hmm. He's not that task master. So I thought it's just a really good reminder of that. Um, And of course, you know, there's a counter you know, point in my head right now. It's like, well, okay, how about with the Pharisees? How about him flipping right. over tables in the temple? Incidentally, I was reading that story to my kids the other day and Athens like, yeah, I don't like that. I'm like, well, what don't you like? I don't like Jesus getting angry and flipping over tables. I tried to make the case, but he was unconvinced. Anyway, you know, it reminds me of, um, it'd be curious to, to read this book in partnership with Mark Galley's book, Jesus Mean and Wild. Mean and Wild, exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah, because that he saying, pulls out those stories. Side. Yeah, right. And and I think the difference is, is that when Jesus was mean and wild, uh, usually, or when he when he was angry and condemnatory in his language, it was towards the, the religious insiders, the right. people that were proud, you know, the Pharisees, right? And Whereas, none, none of those people buy Christian books, so they don't have to worry about it. <laughs> no, and thank God we got rid of all those kinds of people today. Right, but right. they're just you know in, in Scripture, but not with us today. Um, but he, but basically, what Dane is saying is that when you come to Jesus in a posture of humility um, and brokenness, his response is always gentle. It's yeah. always forgiveness, right? Right. It's, it's not the cross. A smoldering the, wick he will not put out or broken yeah, reed, he will not, reed. He will not. Bruised bend. reed. Yeah. The yeah. Isaiah passage. Yeah. Beautiful language, right? Um, so, and, and it's just, and he goes like, he, he quotes a lot of Puritans. Um, uh, and, and it's just a beautiful reminder. And, you know, I mean, like even when people ask me like, why I'm really a Christian. Okay. Like what it boils down to and you strip everything back and, you know, I, I usually wouldn't say like, oh, because the philosophical proofs for God's existence are so compelling right. or the case for the resurrection, even though those things are all important and they have to be there, they're foundational. But at the same time, it was really like when I was a high school student, I started reading through the gospels and I'm like, I like this guy. 
Yeah. This, this, Jesus is awesome. You know what I mean? Like um, aside from the miracles and the, the power and the amazing stuff like that, it's just like who he is. He had a heart for the marginalized. He loved people. He talked to women, he, you know, and then you're like, this is who I want God to be. I think who said that maybe Philip Yancey. Um, this is who I want my God to be. Right. And so this book was just kind of a good reminder of that man. This is who Jesus is. He's a very winsome person, especially if you're the kind of person that's been beat up by religion or by other folks and you need that love and forgiveness as we all do. So, it, it is interesting recommend. how that, that gospel presentation of who Jesus is doesn't fit with one of the more popular American visions of, of a, a violent, angry, um, vengeful Jesus who's out there to defend you know, his people, his church, his whatever, like, you know, that American bravado kind of Jesus, yes. the one with the AR 15 and the bandana <laughs> with the ripping muscles like that. That's a very popular view of Jesus right now. And absolutely, that's not what you actually find in the gospels. And uh, this is maybe unfair, but as I'm reading this, I'm thinking of these descriptions, of course, that Jesus gave of himself and how different it is than how a lot of Christian leaders are. Right. Yeah. I mean, especially some of the like the most successful Christian leaders that have huge churches and ministries. And I'm not saying that they're like, you know, awful guys or anything, but they have that bravado. They have that like, I know I've got the answers and I'm coming out swinging. Right. Um, which is it's just so uh, antithetical to the very nature of Jesus in many ways. Yeah, I, I think it is because, I mean, you know this, you've been to enough of the conferences that I've been to as well, that there there's an exaltation of American corporate culture. Yeah. Right. It's the CEO, the blue chip company CEO leader that is is the epitome of of what a leader is supposed to be. And that gets projected to all these pastors. And this is what you're supposed to be. And you're supposed to lead a mega ministry that way. It is the Steve Jobs yeah. kind of leadership style. So it shouldn't surprise us. That's what we see in so many of our churches and ministries these days. So we're not necessarily trying to emulate the leadership role that Jesus portrays, but the one that American corporate culture displays. Yeah, totally. And I think I don't, when you look at those kind of up, upper echelon of leaders, I don't think that's probably representative of most leaders, most pastors, the kind right. of guy who's quietly plugging away at a church of 200 people. Right. But I think the kind of guy that's like that does tend to rise to the top and have this really successful ministry because he's running the thing like a CEO and it takes off and he's got a lot of charisma. Uh, but it's just a good reminder that like, Hey, I, I think we're starting to see some of the bitter fruits of that, right. Where we go. Yeah. Sometimes well, the, when we the same ethical messes like that, you're seeing well. in American companies is what you're seeing in these mega ministries, right? Right. So yeah. it's not a, not a big shocker that that would be the outcome. No one puts gentle and lowly on their resume. That's <laughs> <laughs> Searching for new senior pastor, must be gifted teacher, seminary educated, gentle and lowly of heart. That, that doesn't come up very much, does it? Five to 10 years experience in being gentle and lowly. <laughs> who wants to follow an Eeyore, right? So, uh, yeah, anyway. Um, so, yeah, good reminder just for your average Christian and for Christian leaders to be like, hey, listen, let's be a little more gentle and lowly. Let's be a little more like Jesus, not just in what we believe and teach, but in how we actually are. Amen. So good, good uh, reminder, good course corrector book. What's your last one, Drew? Last one. I have two more, Sky. Two more. I thought we stuck to three. You're cutting me off. We'll see. It depends how much I like the these, third one. If I let you have a quick, fourth. <laughs> these are quick ones. And I, I got to come clean. I've just started reading this one. So I'm not all the way through. It could, it could take an awful turn and be the worst book ever. It is called, and here's the thing. I need more fiction in my diet. Okay. I don't know what happened to me. And fiber. As an English. Yeah. It's like fiber. I need <laughs> more broccoli. I need more fiction in my diet. I used to read fiction. I used to read poetry. I was an English major. And then somewhere along the line, I just started reading all nonfiction and it's dried up my soul. Okay. So I'm trying to get back into the fiction game. And this book is a novel called The Nameless Things. The okay. author is Sean Smucker. Like the, like the jelly? Like the jelly. Oh, well, no, isn't the jelly? Schmucker. Schmucker, the, right. The jelly, right? Or the jam. The <laughs> right. With a name like Schmucker, it's got to be good, right? Yeah. Well, I actually, this is I, I met one of the heirs of the Schmucker fortune once. Are you serious? Yeah. That's and a oh, there's story. a fortune? I guess it's, yeah, okay. okay. <laughs> the jelly is. <laughs> <laughs> she was very friendly. Was, was she bitter about her last name, though? Uh, not to my knowledge. 
I didn't know she was a, a, a schmucker until later. It was a dinner okay. party. It was a dinner party. All right. Case, yeah. And here's the thing. I think when you have a bad last name, it's nice to have a, at least get a fortune from it. Whereas with me, no fortune. There's no dick fortune. <laughs> There's no dick fortune. And even when my parents pass on, heaven forbid, I'm going to just get a whole bunch of used Christian books. So, yeah. So I'm stuck. My point is I'm stuck with the, the bad last name and no fortune. You, you could have you taken Grace's name. It's the 21st I know. century. People do. I know. What, was, what was her maiden name? Uh, Keelhan. Okay. Kind of cool. Sounds a little Hawaiian. It's actually Irish. And her dad actually suggested <laughs> that. It's also an island. Her dad suggested that. He's like, why don't you take our last name? <laughs> back off dude. i can't imagine why he wouldn't want his daughter to take yours back off <laughs> yeah and i'm not gonna float that now grace is kind of mad at me right now anyway so i can't do that okay so the nameless things Sorry. <clears throat> okay yeah nameless things sean smucker not schmucker uh -huh. smucker and yeah so i i've just started it really i'm a couple chapters in but it's super intriguing and he's a heck of a writer and this is like it's a christian book but not really it's it's uh who is it baker um, but he reminds me of Leif Inger, you know, Peace Like a River. Do you know that okay. book? No. Another beautiful book. Like, honestly, you got to read it. He's just, Leif Inger is, is one of the best living writers. Um, and he writes about Christian themes. So it's kind of interesting. So and what's the, like what's the Sean premise is, of this one? Well, it, it's kind of weird. So it starts off with this like group of people that have, it sounds like maybe come out of this dark cult and they're living at the base of a mountain. And the, the cult was like on the mountain or on the other side of the mountain. So it has this kind of allegorical fantasy feel. Um, and are they very yeah. short with hairy feet? <laughs> Is there a dragon in this mountain? <laughs> Is there a wizard? <laughs> yeah. No. Um, but, and he's, he's stealing some stuff from Dante and anyway, so I don't know much yet, but it's, I'm intrigued and the writing is just beautiful and poignant and literary. Um, and, and here's my thing. Okay. So, and I'm one of the people that do this often we lament and bemoan the lack of good writing in the Christian world, like our good novels or good movies or whatever. Right. Yeah. As evangelicals. We're not exactly known for our amazing art. Maybe that's, that's mean to say, but I think it's true. So you can moan about it, or you can read a book like Sean's, The Nameless Things. Support the creation of really good yes, literature. Of and I don't think he's yeah. like a, a super well-known dude or anything, but he's just, and that he's written a few books. I read, um, I read Light from Distant Stars. That's another one of his that was just incredible. Uh, so yeah, he's just doing great stuff. And okay. it's not like explicitly Christian. It's not like everyone... You know, well, I might, I might put that on my list right, right now in my uh, fiction diet. I'm reading Dune. Oh, yeah. The Frank, the Frank Herbert sci-fi novel, right. which they're making a new. I saw a the movie. movie. Yeah. You saw the trailer. They're, they're, they're making a new movie. Yeah. Yeah. The old one from what is it? 1984. Yeah. I watched the old one. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I've never seen the movies. My brother was a huge fan of this book when we were kids and I never read it. So I'm like, OK, the new one's coming. I'll read it. But I, that's it's kind of uh, scratching my fiction itch for now. But maybe I'll put this one on the list this will make you even itchier all right <laughs> okay Great recommendation all right last one really quick it will make you itchy and last one this is a guilty pleasure pick okay okay i'm not proud of this i'm not proud at all but we've been watching as we're depressed and stuck inside during this pandemic i've been watching Shit's creek have you watched this yeah, uh, I have watched most of it. Okay. I have watched most of it. Do we have to put like a language disclaimer? No, on this it's not episode? spelled like that, Sky. Yeah. But it's it like is S C H I T. Don't let your mind go into the gutter. I think you know. Whenever you're on, we already have language I issues. Know. I know. Um, Don't Google any of these things, by the way. And that that is a Canadian production, so this is right up your alley. That's where I was going. Yeah, totally biased here, and I didn't even realize that at first. But then I saw the little um. What is it? Canadian Broadcasting. Uh, yeah, it's Eugene Levy. Logo. Yeah, and, Eugene and, and Dan Levy. Yes, that's right. And, and yep. his son, is his son's name Daniel, I think? Dan, yep. He's Dan, in, yeah. They're Canadian. They're all Canadian. All Canadian. And I was shocked because most Canadian shows, pains me to say this, are absolutely terrible. Okay. <laughs> oh, it's kind of like on. European Canada, television. Canada has a long history of giving us wonderful comedians yeah, and actors. Right. When they, they come down to the States, and they make good stuff. But trust Michael me. Michael J. Fox. You don't want to uh, watch Canadian television. Yeah, but do uh, not uh, Ryan Reynolds. <laughs> oh, totally. Um, who, what's Me? his name? Oh, Martin Short. Martin Short. Did we say John Candy? 
John Candy. Yeah, all those. Jim Carrey. Uh, Jim Carrey. That's right. He's Canadian. Yeah. Yeah. Every comedian is Canadian. Okay. I knew them Every all. Every comedian. <laughs> well, the good ones come down here. That's right. <laughs> the bad ones have to stay. Right. <laughs> okay. Anyway, it's it's dumb. It's it's inappropriate. Wait, so are parts. you recommending the TV um, show or are you reading something? No. <laughs> no. I'm, this is I'm, not a book. TV show. No, we're going way off the rails here. Okay. Okay. All right. This is like not not super sophisticated stuff and it is not christian and it is not even a book it's a silly how far have you watched the whole thing no no we are how far are you oh like season end of season two maybe oh you're early yeah we're still pretty early because people are like saying things like did you like this episode i'm like oh i don't know what you're talking about yeah i'm curious like there's a lot to love about that show and it's very creatively Uh done but i'm going to be curious to hear your opinion of it in the latter seasons Oh, uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm really no, pr- I'm no prude, um, <laughs> but I did feel like it got kind of preachy. Okay. It got kind of preachy, kind of a not about driven. the gospel. I'm guessing. No, no, we got kind of agenda driven <laughs> and, okay. you know, agree or disagree with the agenda. But it, 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 I think whenever a comedy starts getting agenda driven, it loses some of its humor. Totally. Right. Totally. Even if so, you like the agenda, even if the right. agenda is amazing. Right. Yeah, you're right. That always takes something off it. So, yeah, yeah. And here, so I'm not vouching for the whole thing, obviously. Haven't even seen them all. But it's kind of fun and light and fluffy and silly. Um, And we kind of need that right now. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. And they they won a bazillion awards recently, didn't they? That's right. Yeah. Emmys and things. Yeah. um, Oh, I I read a story recently in New York Times about who's the son, Dan Levy, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Who in Canada, he took a class like a zoom class because of COVID um, on native Canadian history or something like that. And he said something about it online and then like a thousand other people signed up for the class. And this professor's like, what? (laughs) (laughs) And then it is funny because they interviewed the professor and they're like, okay, what kind of student is Dan Levy? And he's like, very average. (laughs) (laughs) Well, yeah, that's where it doesn't matter how good a student he is. He's a, really good marketer exactly yeah i'm sure yeah. i'm sure they're grateful for for the plug that uh they gave them but so yeah so if you're craving canadian content and you're a little bored you might want to check it out so here's my question my last question for you as a canadian drew are, <laughs> are you celebrating uh canadian thanksgiving this year or uh, we already it, did sky it's already passed oh, don't tell me right. you forgot it's like it's like in august right yeah because that's and when the frost hits that's right and we don't do the turkey we cook up a beaver and put poutine on top of it and maple syrup it's delicious it's incredible (laughs) you know what the sad thing is some people will believe that because you can almost say anything about canada found um and people will believe it you know and and a a polite canadian won't disagree right (laughs) yeah exactly well i i thank you drew for coming back on the show i know you guys are quarantined like everyone else to a certain degree when you have little kids at home and things are chaotic and i hope that somehow the holidays are nonetheless refreshing for you yes we'll have our delicious virtual turkey wave hello to my parents on the computer how far away are they from you two hours only oh so we're still figuring that out like okay do we go down there and and become a super spreader event or do we just play see well, I don't know. There's you have a family of five. Yep. And three, two, three kids, two parents. I don't know if that qualifies as a super spreader event. If it's <laughs> well, you get my brother in people. there. Oh, I see. Okay. Other folks. Who knows? Hopefully not. Fingers crossed. All right, Drew. Well, thank you again for your picks um, about the Spanish flu, a gentle and lowly Jesus and the nameless things, a novel that you have barely started. And then <laughs> a canadian comedy which you are two seasons in and can't really form a fully formed opinion no. yet and it's kind of inappropriate it's and quite someone's inter- gonna be mad about it but i have no doubt yeah i hope I, my mom doesn't listen to this one i can't believe you even said the name of the show but i know oh. hey it's my last name i get i will pass along the hate mail to you <laughs> please do and all the comments um if you guys want to get a hold of drew you should go to your website right yes that's right i have a website i forgot what is your, what it's is your, it's just URL? my name, not very creative, Drew Dick, D Y C K dot com. And you can read some stuff. You can see some cheesy pictures of me and my family. All right. If you want to contact Drew, person. go to the website. You can, you can voice your frustration to him directly. <laughs> 
All right, Sounds Jude, good. thanks for being here again. Thanks, guy. The Holy Post Podcast is a production of Phil Vischer Enterprises, that's Phil's company, and Sky Pilot Media, that's Sky's company. Production assistance by Julie Betcher. Editing by Jason Rugg. Help us create more thoughtful Christian media by supporting us at patreon.com forward slash holy post. Also, be sure to leave a review on iTunes so more people can discover thoughtful Christian commentary plus ukulele and occasional butt news. Visit holypost.com for show notes, news stories, and more.